Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflections. And today we are continuing our study in the book of James. And I wasn't able to uh, record the last couple of days uh, because of some challenges that I had going on. But uh, looking forward to getting back into our study. James chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 is what we'll be studying today. So if you have a Bible, I'd like to ask you to take it and turn with me to James chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. Let's begin. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which Though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want to remind you of just a simple summary statement of this passage. And here it is. The following section was meant to remind us of the power of the tongue and the need to keep it controlled. Our tongue, just a little member in our body, is very powerful. It can accomplish a lot of good things. It can accomplish a lot of bad things. And really what James is going to do is he's going to start with the bad before he gets to the good. But how we speak is a very important thing. And so let's begin with a couple of simple observations, and we'll dig into some practical applications from what he says in these verses. The first observation is this. We need to be very cautious about who we place in spiritual leadership. Here's the way he puts it in verse number one. He says, My brethren, be not many masters. That word master is an interesting word. It has the idea of someone who's a teacher, and they're teaching authoritatively. He says, Don't be quick and don't multiply people in positions of authority. And let's remember that when James is writing, he's primarily thinking about the context of the church. You know, churches need teachers. Obviously, churches need pastors. And most of the churches in the New Testament didn't just have one pastor. They actually had several individuals who were in that position. I think of the church at Ephesus. And when Paul calls the church together, he calls the elders of the church. He calls several men who are in spiritual leadership. And whenever we see other, other churches and Paul is talking to them or about them, he tends to talk about several individuals that are in leadership. So James isn't saying that it's wrong to have more than one teacher who's teaching authoritatively in a church. He's warning against rushing people into that position, appointing people who are novices. They're not ready for that. They don't have the spiritual maturity to be in that position. And he's saying don't be quick to add lots of people into a position of authority. The second observation is the reason why. We need to be cautious because teachers will be held to a higher level of accountability to God. Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, knowing that we, he doesn't say they, he includes himself because he's a teacher. He says, we shall receive a greater condemnation. The idea is that we're going to be held to a higher standard of judgment. And you know, this actually makes a lot of sense. So if a person is teaching, that means that they have more information than the average person that's in that room. I mean, we put a person in a position of teaching because we believe that they know something that they can communicate. So that means a person is interacting with lots and lots of information. They have a lot of knowledge of what they're addressing. And so on, on that level, it makes them more accountable. A second thing is they're communicating to a large group and they're communicating from a point of authority. And so the, 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 the ability to influence is expanded because of the position that they're in. And therefore, God's going to hold them to a greater level of accountability. And the good that's done or the damage that's done is going to be expanded because of that position. And so what James is saying is, look, let's be slow to put people in authority where they're teaching because if we put them in that place, they're going to be held to a higher standard by God. A third observation the way that we use our tongue is one of the greatest tests of our spiritual maturity. In verse 2, he puts it like this. In many things, we offend all. He's saying everybody who is a sinner, 
and that's me and that's you, we, we stumble in, in some way. We, we do it all the time. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't have to get on my knees before the Lord and say, God, I did this, I said this, I thought this, I handled this situation this way, and I confess it to you and I ask you to forgive me. I want to have a healthy walk with you. And I have to confess those things to God every single day. He says, we all offend in many ways. But then he says this, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and he's able to bridle his whole body. Now, the, word that, the way that he uses the word perfect, we have to remember, is he's talking about someone who's spiritually matured. They're whole. They're complete. He says, if a man has the ability to control his tongue and all that he says, he is fully spiritually matured. Well, this is telling us something about the use of our tongue and its relationship to our maturity. If we are not matured in the faith, it comes out in what we say. If we're growing in the knowledge of the Lord and we're becoming more and more like Christ, that will be, begin to be reflected in the way that we speak. And if a person truly is a spiritually mature individual, that, that doesn't mean that they're perfect in the sense that they don't sin anymore, but the truth is that they really do have a very healthy, matured walk with God. That's a person who's going to be very guarded in how they use their tongue. They're going to be cautious. They're going to use their tongue in a, in a very Christ-centered way. And so really what he's saying is that the way that we speak is a reflection of how mature we actually are. A fourth observation, the tongue is a powerful tool that can be used for tremendous evil. Now, later on, as we get into the rest of chapter 3, we're going to see that he doesn't just say the tongue's evil and there's no good use of the tongue. He's going to talk about very positive ways that we can use our tongue. And so it's not just that the tongue is always bad, but he begins with how dangerous the use of the tongue can be because he wants us to be sobered and he wants us to understand what it is that allows a person to use their words for good and for the glory of God. And so this is what he says in verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us. We turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which, though they be great, are driven with a fierce wind, yet they're turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now James uses several illustrations of large things, very powerful things, things that are used in, 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 in very productive ways that are controlled by something very small. He talks about a horse. When we talk about a horse, that was the ancient car. That was the ancient mode of transportation. That was the ancient tractor. When a person had a horse, their entire livelihood many times was connected to the power of that animal. And he says, you can control that powerful animal with just this little piece of metal in its mouth. He says, think about a ship. A lot of the industry that went on in the Roman Empire, a lot of, a lot of the commerce was really connected to traveling all around the Mediterranean Sea. And so this massive ship that's transporting all of these goods, that's being used in, a, in an important way, it's being guided, navigated from point A to point B through storms, by this rudder that's very small in relationship to the rest of the ship. And he says, think about a fire, a mighty fierce fire that can be so destructive. It can destroy so many things. It could destroy a city, it could destroy a home. It could destroy a person's life because of what it destroys. That huge fire begins with just a small spark. He says, your tongue is just like that. Your tongue is a small member in your body Yet it has the power to do very destructive things. It can make tremendous, it can really influence you, the people around you, the, 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 the church that you're a part of, your family. Your tongue is a powerful little member in your body. And so he's reminding us of the danger of using our tongue in destructive ways. Your tongue can destroy what was once a very strong relationship with another person. It could destroy the reputation of somebody for the rest of their lives. It could put someone behind bars if you're testifying against them in a court of law. It can divide a church. It could start a conflict between nations when 
when leaders begin using their tongue in irresponsible ways, it could, it could create a war that, that is devastating for years. His point is that our tongue can be used for tremendous damage. We must be very careful about how we use our tongue. So as we think about these verses this morning, how can we apply this in a really practical way? Let me share with you a couple of things I jotted down this morning, and I hope they'll be a help to you. The first is this. One of the greatest evidences of a person's profession of faith is the way he speaks. Both those impulsive uses of his tongue and the premeditated ones. Let's not forget that the last thing we talked about was the fact that a person can say that they have faith, but the evidence of their true faith is how they live. Isn't it interesting that the first thing that he addresses after that's that conversation about the evidence of a person's faith is how they use their tongue. I think the reason that he does that is because the way that we speak is one of the truest reflections of what's in our soul. And if a person truly has faith in Christ and the Spirit of God is really changing that individual more and more into the image of Christ, that is going to be quickly reflected in the way the person uses their tongue. A second thing is this. Those who handle the scriptures, those who are in positions of influence, need to be so cautious and so sobered by the responsibility that they have to use their words in productive, godly ways. You know, if a person's a pastor, if a person is in a position of leadership and they speak a lot, they better be so cautious about what they say because what they say has the power of good and it has the power of evil behind it. A third is this. One of the greatest evidences of our growth into spiritual maturity is how we use our tongue. The truth is that it's not just an evidence of the fact that I am a Christian. It's also an evidence of how far I've grown and matured in my Christian walk. As I become more and more like Christ, it's going to be reflected more and more in the way that I communicate to other people. When I get pressed and I'm going through difficult circumstances, as I mature in the Christian faith, it's going to start changing how I respond to people and the things that I say. When I think about the premeditated uses of my mouth and what I'm trying to accomplish through my words, that is going to be a reflection of that level of maturity that's developing within us. And then a fourth application. Let's have a healthy heart that's growing in spiritual maturity because that is ultimately the primary influencer of the way that we speak. It says in Proverbs, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And so if I want to learn to control my mouth, if I want to be in a position where I'm using my tongue for good and not evil, then the ultimate way to address that issue is to change what's going on within my heart. If my heart is healthy, if my heart is growing in spiritual maturity, then my words will be edifying and uplifting and Christ-centered. And if my heart is very troubled and my heart is not healthy and it's not growing in the Lord and there's a lot going on inside that really shouldn't be there that I'm not addressing, that's going to come out in the things that I say. You know, as we think about this discussion about the tongue, I think that this is very practical and it's something that we can begin addressing right now as we sit here this morning. If this, uh, if this time of, of studying God's Word has been encouragement to you, I hope that you'll just take a moment to uh, jot down a note of encouragement. Uh, if you'd like to share it, I hope that you'll do that and others can be benefited by it. And uh, I'm so glad that I get to be back this weekend. I had uh, several things that I had to address in the mornings and I wasn't able to uh, record like usual. But this week, we should be back on track. And uh, it's been good to see each of you this morning. Let's bow for a word of prayer and then we will see you, Lord willing, next time. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had today to read this section of Scripture, a section that's very practical and that really gets to the heart of our interpersonal relationships. Father, help us to be a people who are growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, where the Holy Spirit is influencing the way that we think and what we love, and ultimately this will, will come out in the way that we speak to one another. Father, help our, the reactions, the way that we use our tongue in those pressure moments. Help that to be edifying, uplifting. And I pray that those premeditated uses of our words, the way that we think through communicating to others, 
would be for good and not for evil. I ask that you would bless those who have the opportunity to listen to this uh, short Bible uh, devotional this morning. May they be encouraged by it, and may it help them throughout the rest of their day. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's been good to see you this morning. I hope that you have a wonderful day, and Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.